Good afternoon and welcome all. Um, welcome to you all from uh, Cleveland, Ohio, um, where the United Church of Christ National Offices are situated. Um, I am Reverend Dr. Karen Georgia Thompson, and I serve as the Associate General Minister for Wider Church Ministries. And I have the pleasure this afternoon of hosting this webinar on the Commission on the Status of Women. And um, last week, the Commission uh, met virtually. Um, it is always uh, a wonderful event. It is part of the United Nations Women's Office. And so this afternoon, I have with me um, Professor Dr. Isabel Apawo Piri, uh, who serves as the Deputy General Secretary for Public Witness and Diaconia for the World Council of Churches. And as a part of her responsibilities, she holds oversight both for the United Women's, for the United Nations and for gender justice. And um, before coming to the World Council of Churches, she was a professor of African theology, uh, the Dean and head of the School of Religion, Philosophy and Classics and director of the Center for Constructive Theology at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. She also served as the editor of the Journal of Gender and Religion in Africa. And she has been engaged with the churches and the ecumenical movement for many years, more than we wanna count. And so um, she also um, served as the coordinator from 2002 to 2007, um, as the general coordinator of the Circle of Concerned African Women Theologians. We are so happy to have uh, uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Piri with us today um, from Switzerland, where we have, I think at this point, given the time change, a six hour time difference. So we're incredibly happy to have her uh, with us because it is um, after 8 p.m. Uh, her time. So thank you uh, for being here, my sister. We've worked for many years together. And also with us is uh, Rebecca Cho. And uh, Rebecca serves as the Associate for Global Advocacy and Education for the Global Ministries, uh, for Global Ministries, which is the joint mission agency uh, between the United Church of Christ and the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. And so she is a part of uh, the Cleveland-based team housed um, in the UCC national offices. She is a part of the Ecumenical Women at the UN where she serves on behalf um, of the United Church of Christ and um, uh, serves in the role of adv global advocate and advocacy um, uh, identifying the priorities for our global partners and working in that arena. And so I am very excited to have both. Rebecca has also an extensive background in international studies that she puts to use every single day on our behalf. And welcome to you all as well. And thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. So uh, this year, the 65th session of the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women met. It is the UN's largest annual gathering on gender equality and women's empowerment. And so it took place on the 15th to the 26th of March under the theme, women's full and effective participation and decision-making in public life, as well as the elimination of violence for achieving gender equality and empowerment of all women and girls. I also want to note that um, when we look at the sustainable development goals that have, um, uh, that, that we have, um, that the SDG number five is to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. So we have that um, coming out of the UN also as a benchmark um, for this body of work. So um, I wanna start off by asking actually both um, Becca and, um, and Isabel, um, you know, what was the experience of uh, the Commission on the Status of Women this year, considering it was virtual 
Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so a little bit different than years past. Dr. Peary. Right, thank you. Um, it was different, okay? It was different in that he, um, for the World Council of Churches, you know, this was our opportunity to increase the number of participants. We were allowed, you know, to bring in 20 participants, you know. So for that reason, it was good. And uh, we took advantage of that and indeed invited, you know, um, women and men from the ecumenical fellowship, you know, to participate. And because it was online, then it was possible, you know, for you know women from Fiji, you know, from India or from whichever part of the world, you know, to be able to participate at you know 24 hour clock. Whilst when we meet in New York, then we are limited in time. And therefore it's only those who are awake at that particular time who participate. So um, the, there were advantages of having this online. It increased participation. I guess the difficulty for me was that, you know, because you are now at home and my job is going on. And at the same time, I have also to participate. So I was busy with work, you know, lots of meetings, webinars, you know, happening at my workplace. And in the evenings, instead of resting, then I had to follow what's going on with the commission, you know, for the status of women. So I found it very exhausting, really exhausting. I, I missed the time when I would be in New York in one place and my time was devoted to following what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Becca. Yeah, I would definitely agree. Uh, my attention was also split, um, you know, with the variety of things happening in my workplace. So I had to pay, try to do as much as I could following the Commission on the Status of Women, as well as doing some other uh, my, of my daily, daily work tasks and meetings. And um, so it was, it was difficult to have my attention split like that. I do enjoy being together in this community of advocates for gender justice, mm -hmm. all together in these big meeting rooms where you can you know, have informal networking time and you can meet others. Um, as part of my work with ecumenical women at the UN, and we have worship services every morning, which we tried to, which we did uh, virtually, but of course required more preparation ahead of time and required, you know, technological capacity that we don't usually need to have. Um, so it was, it was a little different and, um, you know, doing the orientation ahead of CSW with ecumenical women was a little bit different. So I, I agree with all of what Isabel just said. Uh, it was good to try and widen our scope um, because people didn't have to pay for hotels, which can get expensive in mm -hmm. Midtown New York City, <laughs> and they didn't have to pay for their flights to get there. It was more accessible for more people, um, which I think is great. Uh, and hopefully they can continue some of that accessibility moving forward. Um, uh, yeah, it was, it, I, I enjoyed it. And I really want to encourage more people to come and be part of this amazing community. Yeah. And the other thing that I missed was, uh, you know, the ability to go to um, missions, you know, like, you know, country states, their missions to go and lobby, you know, in advance, you know, um, so that you can influence, you know, the document through the missions that we were not able to do because there was no opportunity for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I want to, um, I want to come back to that um, as a follow-up question afterwards, because I'm sure that there are folks who are saying, what document um, and what are the missions? So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So I want to make a note. Um, I, I want to share some information here. If you go to the UN Women's website and um, to particularly 
the UN Commission on the Status of Women, some of what you will find there is the following. It says, newly released data shows that progress to achieve gender equality in public life and decision-making has been slow. Mm -hmm. Women make up 25% of parliamentarians globally and only three countries have 50% or more women in parliament. Mm -hmm. Less than 1% of parliamentarians are women under 30 years of age. So now we're talking about representation in government. Mm -hmm. um, it also says women make up only 13% of negotiators 6% of mediators and 6% of signatories in formal peace processes. In 2020, only 7.4% 7, 7 of Fortune 500 companies were run by women. Mm -hmm. And just 22 countries in the world are headed by a woman. And I looked it up because I wanted to know how many countries are in the world. Mm -hmm. There are 195 if you count the Holy See and um, what's the other one? But anyway, there are 195. So out of 195 countries, there are 22 women, 22 countries headed by women. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted women disproportionately from loss of jobs to rise in violence against women and unpaid care workers. Although women are at the front line of COVID-19 response as healthcare workers, innovators and leaders, their contributions remain less visible and less valued. Only 3.5% of COVID task forces across 87 countries have any kind of gender parity. So, and um, we would add the church in here as well, right? When we talk about, um, about issues of, of gender equality, um, representation, um, holding positions of power. So um, I, wanna, I wanna pull our attention to that. What would you name as um, some of the priorities for, um, for gender justice? Um, uh, particularly also looking from the perspective of um, being church um, and the representation um, that we have in the WCC um, that's in Isabel's side. And then also what do these priorities mean when we talk about um, a US context and within the United Church of Christ is how I would frame that for Becca. So, um, you know, based on, on these numbers, you know, what does this mean um, in terms of how we should be prioritizing um, these issues? Yeah, um, in terms of uh, the WCC, um, uh, the WCC Geneva Secretariat, right, is really very sensitive towards issues of full equity and uh, to make sure that the numbers are actually balancing. In the leadership, we make sure that there's equal numbers of women and men. And in the central committee, the leadership itself, we have a woman and then uh, a woman moderator and a woman vice moderator and one man as a vice moderator. So there you can see that you know, there's effort you know, being made you know, to actually implement and increase the women's participation. Among the program executives, we also try very hard to make sure that we have equal numbers of uh, male and female staff. But that's the secretariat, right? The WCC is a fellowship of 350 churches all over the world, right? That's where then, you know, gender issues become a challenge because, you know, each church is independent. They make their own decisions. We come together because we want to show that we are united in Christ. Right. But that unity does not mean that we have similar policies when it comes to gender issues. 
there are some members of the WCC that don't even want to, to talk about women's ordination, right? Let alone have a woman, you know, lead uh, a commission or what they, they, they tolerate it, but they have difficulties with, you know, women leadership. And on the other side, you know, then we have, you know, churches that uh, have got women bishops, you know, women in very senior positions. They've got, you know, women who are ordained, you know, women professors in their theological seminaries and women students. And yet we also have others where there are no women students at all. So then what we do in the WCC is then to create space where we can have the theological and biblical conversations on these issues, you know, to make sure that we understand why we as Christians should lead by example and fight for the justice of every human being, right? That's easy to say, but difficult in practice. Yeah, and I would also say that, you know, for the past however many centuries, millennia, the church has been used and the Bible has been used as a tool for uh, women's oppression. And mm -hmm. it's really only been more recently to, that we've had churches speak up and say, no, actually, this is not what we believe as Christians. So, uh, I mean, the, the UCC likes to pride itself on being at the forefront of a lot of these progressive Christian movements, um, but we've never had a female general minister and president. Um, and we have, you know, two female associate general ministers, um, but we've not had that in the top leadership of our church. Um, and so I'd, I wanna point that out for, for the UCC side. But also um, you were talking, you put out some numbers about women's leadership and women's presence. Um, but I would also say that presence doesn't mean participation also, mm -hmm. right? Just because there's a, a woman on your executive committee or in your, you know, on your board doesn't mean that they are participating as fully or as um, uh, sharing their, their full views and opinions as much as others are. So, you know, while I think that, you know, maybe some gender quotas for, for boards or in government um, positions might be a, a good idea in some instances, it doesn't always mean, you know, just because women are at the table doesn't mean that they're respected and listened to and are participating fully. Um, right, so the, there's that. And then also um, the WHO, World Health Organization, just came out with a report um, that said one in three women globally will experience violence in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. One in three women. Um, I think uh, talking about gender justice generally, I think that is the biggest issue um, that should take the most priority. And this violence, you know, takes a variety of forms, but, um, you know, and it hasn't changed. The, the last WHO report that had these statistics, I think was about 10 years ago, and it was the same. It was one in three women globally. Um, so, you know, there's three women on this call right now, uh, right? Just to, to point that out. So, and, and that exists everywhere. Yeah, it's a, it's a persistent problem around the world. Um, in the US, in our churches also, mm -hmm. um, you know, I can guarantee you in your, in your local churches, there's at least one woman who's experienced uh, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, um, you know, other, t other forms of violence as well. So um, I just wanna, I, I wanted to name that. Um, and I think that, that might bring us into the, the conversation around the Thursdays and black campaign. I don't know if, if that's, uh, an appropriate way to go next, Karen Georgia, um, but I would love to have Isabel talk a little bit about the Thursdays in Black yeah. campaign. Yeah, I, I, I just, let's see. No, we can't hear you, Karen. Yeah, so before we get to Thursdays in Black, mm -hmm. um, because Isabel, I wonder from a global perspective, mm -hmm. um, what would you identify as the priorities? So um, Becca um, brought up, um, uh, gender-based violence um, as, you know, and, and that has, of course, multiple connections. And that's one of the things that we're seeing 
particularly around um, this COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to hear um, a little bit more, and I'm sure that there are those who are wondering, like, you know, are there, as we talk about um, gender-based violence, what are some of the other things in terms of issues that we're also seeing globally. So I wanna name that um, and see what you have to say, if there's anything else that you would say from your perspective, and then talk to you know, kind of segue into some of the specifics. Um, I, I agree with Becca, you know, 100% that you, um, issues of gender-based violence are a, a priority, even for the WCC, that's a priority, right? Another area which I consider to be a priority, but maybe we are not prioritizing it yet, is women's education. Mm. Because if you want women to participate effectively, you know, they need to have equal education, right? And with equal education, you assume that, you know, that would also give them then a chance to to get employed and you know get promoted into these senior positions. And for me, education is not just the basic education, but as high as you possibly can go, right? Because you know, with women, uh, especially you know, from Africa, where I come from, there's a struggle between um, putting your education as a priority and the desire then to get married and start a family, you know, because every woman in the African context wants to get married because culture expects you to get married. There's pressure, you know, coming from our families that, you know, you have to get married. So when you choose education, um, it means you are delaying, you know, the marriage bit in order so that you can, you know, have good education. And good education also means, you know, you, you become um, a threat to men, right? Who thinks that, you know, you are too educated and therefore you cannot make a good wife, right? And then uh, for those that you are working with, you are also a threat to them because you are constantly raising these gender issues and it becomes uh, like, you know, you are making their lives uncomfortable, but you are just mentioning your reality, right? Because my reality is that indeed, as an educated woman, I do not get the same respect that men you know, who have similar education do, right? So you are constantly fighting for attention, you know, constantly putting forward, you know, gender issues. And in my case, because I'm in the, um, my background is in the academic world, you are putting gender issues on the curriculum, which is ignored most of the times, right? People can go through theological studies without any consideration about, you know, gender studies or feminist theology. But I think these are priorities, you know, when we are training our ministers, they need to learn, you know, about gender issues because that's the reality of the church that they will minister. Thank you. So as we name these, these two areas, um, violence against violent, gender-based violence um, and the statistics there, and then also the importance of women's education. I wanna, I wanna circle back and talk about and ask the question, how can the church play an active role in addressing the challenges that are facing women and perhaps what are we doing? And as I frame that, I want to name that the United Church of Christ no longer has a women's desk. So years ago, we um, dismantled our, our, our women's desk. So we don't have an intentional space that is addressing um, 
addressing these issues, even though there's um, certainly intersectionality in um, other bodies of work that include um, some of these issues that we're talking about around gender justice. So how can the church address these issues um, when we talk about um, what's facing women globally? Hmm. Well, you know, for me, I, I feel the church needs to lead by example, right? Because, you know, we have um, advocacy offices in the churches, right? And we want to speak to the governments, right? And if you are speaking to the government, then you must make sure that he, your house is in order, right? Where if you are asking the government to deal with gender issues, then you yourself must also have a gender policy. You must have, um, a, you recognize that, you know, gender issues are a reality and therefore your budgeting must be gender sensitive, right? So that you are also putting gender issues as a priority when you are making your budgets, right? Then you can talk to the government about, you know, okay, increase, you know, funding for women's projects increase funding for women's education, increase funding for women's empowerment, be it in the economic issues or climate change or what. But you yourselves need to start by doing that. Because you know, we, we can't afford to ignore gender issues in the church. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. Uh, and I would encourage folks to look in their local churches um, and say, you know, are there women in decision making roles? Are there women in on these various committees that are doing budgetary decisions on, on mission decisions on those types of things, um, right? It's one thing you know, to have those people present and participating in the, in, in the discussion, um, but are we really listening? And are we listening to what's important uh, in their lives, in the local communities' lives? Are we paying our female pastors the same as we would pay our male pastors, right? So um, I want I have to kind of start from our own houses, um, but also um, I think it's important to include in these, um, in our seminary trainings, as well as Isabel was saying earlier, um, talking about um, looking at our theologies and looking at the way that we talk about these women that are in the Bible and looking at the way that, um, you know, they, they're represented in our churches and the way that they're represented uh, to us because, you know, we need to have these examples because, for so long, are the Bibles been used to put people, put women uh, in their place, right? With these you know, huge air quotes around that, which, uh, yeah. So um, I, I don't know if I have anything else to, to add other than, yeah, we need to get our own house in order. And we need to also say why we as Christians believe that women, uh, you know, deserve equality and equity and, um, you know, of the variety of these intersecting issues, um, you know, there's you can take a, a a gender lens to a whole, pretty much any kind of issue you want to look at, right? Um, so, like, there's the if you talk about peacemaking, there's a, a gender lens you can look at it through. There's all these different ways in which um, we can look at a, a whole variety of justice and advocacy issues. Mm -hmm. Um, so um, I'm also paying attention to some of what's being raised. So let me clarify about the language of the women's desk. What, um, what um, we um, want to say in this moment is that we're talking about women's ministry in the, um, in the, in the, in the church or in our setting. So in some places we call that the women's desk. It's a place that holds um, that representation and body of work. So that's a, more, a different way of talking about women's ministry. 
um, mm -hmm. which is not always, um, you know, just about what we do in the church, but it's also about advocacy. So it would mm -hmm. be the full composite um, of, um, of that body of work. Um, I want to come back to talking about, um, about CSW um, and um, coming, coming out of CSW, this, the, the, the entire meeting, of course, was framed in the complexities of COVID-19, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, even in terms of talking about, you know, how the meeting happened, you know, how you can participate, you know what I mean? There's this, there's this um, overshadowing of, of COVID-19. And COVID-19 has pointed to what I call um, a lot of fractures in our system, right? So we've heard that around issues facing people of color, um, marginalized communities globally, and the ways that um, they have uh, been displaced. Um, so I want to come back to this moment of COVID-19 and what we're, um, what we're learning about um, how this is impacting women, um, and particularly also in the two areas that you have both spoken to, one which would be the gender-based violence, um, and the second around the education of women. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak a little bit, maybe from the CSW perspective, about what the global narratives are when we talk about these two particular areas and, um, and COVID-19 especially? Mm. One of the things that you mentioned is that in um, reporting on violence against women increased you know, during the lockdown, right? Um, it's because you, know, you are limited in space, you are at home, right? And the things that, you know, sometimes you are able to get away from when you are at the office, this time the office is at home and the person who beats you at other times, but occasionally because you are not together all the time, then the, in the, the beating then increases. That's what I heard, you know, most women saying that working from home is becoming difficult because um, one, the fact that you are in a lockdown situation, there's a mental stress. And then that is translated into arguments in the home happening more often and leading into violence. And sometimes, you know, the violence can be verbal and at other times it can be physical, but it can also be spiritual and economic, you know, violence where you are denied, you know, things. So all these different manifestations of violence were, are happening in the lockdown context. The biggest one is girls, right? Girls are now staying at home instead of going to school. So chances of sexual abuse by members of the family at home has increased. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, especially in the context where I come from Africa, pregnancy of uh, teenagers has increased because these girls are being raped in their own homes by their relatives. Okay, so then their education is curtailed, right? Because now she has a, there are no places where they can go for uh, sexual reproductive health. And therefore, then they are pregnant and uh, they can't go to school. And therefore, then we increase poverty in their lives. So there's that area that you know we need to be concerned about. The other one, which is also was discussed at the CSW, was the issue of um, working from home is difficult when you've got children, right? Because in addition to 
doing your office work, then you also have to be involved in the schooling of your children. Right? So to balance the two is very difficult if you do not have a supportive partner. Right. Who can help out, you know, with the children as well, whilst you do your work. That's another area that, you know, uh, COVID, you know, has exposed. And then there's uh, the caregiving to the sick people. In most societies at a global level, they look at the caregiving as a woman's job, right? So if he, then you have somebody sick in the home, you know, with COVID-19, then it's the mother who takes care of that person. And in the process, you increase chances of your own infection, right? So all these things, you know, we need to look at as, you know, problems that have been highlighted as a result of, you know, COVID. And then there's the issue of people losing their jobs. Right, because most women are in temporary jobs. And therefore, uh, if you cannot work from your workplace, then you lose that job. And therefore you are also losing income. And that becomes a problem that contributes to this violence that we are talking about. So yes, COVID-19 you know, has exposed all these economic um, social education problems that most families, you know, normally experience, but they become worse during the period of COVID-19. Yeah, and I want to add to that. Um, globally, most women have jobs in the informal economy. So they, you know, have a cart on the side of the road where they sell produce or some of these other more informal type jobs. So, you know, when there's a lockdown in the city, they can't go out and sell their produce. Mm -hmm. They don't earn money for that day. How are they going to feed their families? Um, so there's there's that on top. And then there's no support from the government. Like they've, they're doing this informally. They don't have, you know, the what we think in the, in the US, right? The unemployment insurance, they don't have that access. And, um, and I want to reiterate that these are all global issues that we've seen highlighted here in the US as well. One of the numbers that's hit me um, was most striking to me was the amount of women who have dropped out of the labor force uh, mm -hmm. over the past year in the United States for a variety of reasons. They've just, they've stopped working in this formal economy. They've stopped looking for a job. A lot of that is because they're taking care of their children, helping them through school, or they've lost their job and, you know, excuse me, have, have started to take care of their parents or their children and those types of things. But um, it, it was startling for me to see some of those, uh, the graphs that have been shown at the, the high rate of dropout of women in the, in the economy in the US. Um, and I see there's a, a question in the chat about human trafficking um, uh, in, the, in the pandemic. And I would say um, with all the, the border closures and all of the shutdowns, some of that has decreased. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but we don't know what will happen in the future. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's been some concern that I've heard from some of our global partners in, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia and Southern Asia, that it might actually increase to levels before the pandemic as economies open back up again, uh, borders open back up again, there'll be a demand for labor and there's going to be, you know, women who have been uh, economically, you know, held back under COVID-19 who want to go back out and get jobs, but there's no jobs in their community. So they're more um, uh, vulnerable to traffickers and people who will take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, it's, it's a good thing that it's decreased uh, with the lockdowns and under the pandemic, but I think that there's a, a huge possibility for it to go way back up. Um, I, I mean, we've, we've not gotten rid of the problem of human trafficking. And until we have you know, a world in which everyone is, is free to do the type of work they want to do and free to, to be who they want to be, we're not ever going to get rid of, of trafficking. I want to I want to turn for a moment. Um, I um, we're at about um, 15 minutes to the end of this. Um, I would encourage if there are any questions, um, 
that those be framed in the, um, in the chat if they can be. Um, I wanna turn to global advocacy mm. because um, at the beginning, when we started into conversation, one of the things that Isabel mentioned was um, missing the opportunities to visit the missions mm. for, um, for various countries. Mm. And um, I would like for both of you to talk about um, um, what that means. I know what that means, but I think many in our audience would not know what it means to visit missions um, of, um, of countries during um, uh, CSW and the importance of that. Mm. Well, maybe I need to start by explaining that, he, you know, during the, uh, the Commission on the Status of Women, they produce a document, right? They mention in advance what the document is going to be, the title of the document and the issues that will be discussed, right? So then the countries know in advance what they want to say about that particular issue. And one other thing that happens you know, during this time is that they review the decisions that they made five years ago. So in this particular case, um, CSW 65 reviewed the decisions that were made in uh, CSW 60, right? So then you need to lobby, you know, to make sure that he, those decisions that were made five years ago are not taken out, okay? That he, if anything, they should be strengthened. So what we do is either, then you visit the governments, the missions, right, of different governments. Say, for example, you go to the one of Sweden because you know that he, with Sweden, they are very strong on issues of sexual reproductive health, right? And if that is a priority for us, then we need to go to that mission and, you know, encourage them, you know, to indeed raise their voices on these issues. But you also go to those countries that you know will be against, right? Let's say Malawi is one of those countries that will be against. So I need to go to their mission, to their representative who will be making decisions there and speak to them and you know, tell them why I think it's important that the issues of sexual and reproductive health should remain despite that this is a very controversial issue when it comes to different states, especially those that he, um, okay, those that have declared that you know they are either Muslim states or they are Christian nations, right, that are totally in control of women's bodies, right. So you want to go to those states and begin to negotiate with them, you know, the language that can be used, you know, to make sure that he, you don't lose on what you have gained already. So what happened then this year is that he, that chance of negotiation was not there. So we have lost in terms of um, the language, you know, that is being used, you know, for this document that has been produced. Previously, they used, you know, strong language, you know, that he promoted human rights of women in different areas, you know, of, you know, women's bodies. Now we have, you know, states that he are actually either pulling out, like in the case of Turkey, that has pulled out, you know, from um, the, you know, conventions that they had signed you know, to protect women. And they're using religion, you know, as one of the reasons that he, they don't allow their women, you know, to be free to take ownership of their bodies, you know, and make decisions, right? So um, advocacy becomes very important, you know, to 
make sure that the gains are not lost and that we strengthen the document in favor of women's human rights. Yeah, and I would say that it's similar to you know, lobbying your member of Congress on a particular bill here in the US, right? So you go to the US mission and say, hey, I'm a US citizen and I think this is important and I'm a person of faith and this is important to my faith. Mm -hmm. um, the other good thing about being in person at CSW is there is opportunity to gather as faith communities, right? So the ecumenical women at the UN has a space for, for their member communions to, to be together as, you know, Christians and as members of uh, people of faith and talk about why their faith means that they're advocating for gender justice. And there's lots of various interfaith and ecumenical spaces to do a lot of that. Um, and just also to clarify around CSW, the, the member states all get together and talk about this document that Isabel was saying. And then on the side of these things, all the NGOs get together and they mm -hmm. have various events and various, various things happening. So there's really a lot going on and there's a lot of places in which we can advocate and make our voices heard in the, the questions we raise in various events, uh, as well as going to the missions uh, of various countries. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, every, every country has a, has a mission at the UN, um, so they have representation there. Um, the downside for a lot of these documents is that they're not really legally binding. Mm -hmm. So it's these countries are signing up and saying, oh, yes, of course, we'll agree to do that. But like, for example, the U.S. Uh, signed the, um, oh, my goodness, the uh, Convention to Eliminate Discrimination Against Women. Uh, it's called CEDAW. I don't know. I don't remember the full acronym at this point. The U.S. has signed it but has not ratified it. So like that, we're not held to account on some of these things. So this is also a place in which our advocacy can be important. We can go to the Senate in the US and say, hey, did you know we've signed this convention that's 50 years old and we haven't ratified it, it yet? It, this is important to us. We need to ratify this and we need to hold um, our countries accountable to the conventions that have been ratified and have been signed. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, again, the, the UN system, there's no real mechanism for you know what happens if you break or pull out of a convention and, and, and things like that. So um, there's upsides and there's downsides because you know the UN Secretary General has spoken a lot about um, uh, with the impact of COVID and lockdowns on women. And he's highlighted that numerous times and has really been a voice uh, along with the Executive Director of UN Women uh, on the issues of women, uh, particularly under these COVID lockdowns. But um, you know, he's, he's an influential voice, but there's no, there's nothing binding about any of these documents. Thank you both. So, um, I just want to speak to, um, our context here in the, in the United Church of Christ. And I know that Becca has certainly represented the United Church of Christ, um, and global ministries to uh, the Commission on the Status of Women over the years. Um, and I just wonder um, out loud in this space, what would it mean for our women in the United Church of Christ to be more actively engaged in global advocacy along with our global partners, with the, w with the World Council of Churches and with others who are in these spaces speaking to, um, to the various uh, missions to, um, uh, from countries to the UN and actually seeing this avenue for global advocacy as being as important as our ability to lobby our Congress or to have voice and what it means for us to strengthen the voices of women to amplify that globally you know what I mean? Um, there is strength in our numbers. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to put that out there because we we need to wrap up. And uh, Isabel, I hope that we could have you back again at some point to continue this conversation about how we do this work together mm -hmm. um, uh, as women, as um, but as faith-based community, and more than that, as Christians, what this means. So um, just in a final takeaway, um, um, I would just invite you both. What would you say to those who are on the call who are saying, well, how, how can I get involved? Or you yeah. know, how, can, how can my voice 
also be a part of this. And Isabel, I'll also have to bring you back to talk mm -hmm. about Thursdays in Black. Yeah. Which, <laughs> which we did not quite get to, uh, but it's also very important. So next time we're gonna talk about Thursdays in Black. Um, <laughs> uh, so we're gonna have to find a time for, um, for uh, Isabel to come back, uh, Becca. Um, but what would you say um, to, to women who, are, who want to get involved um, and maybe asking how could they do that? Right, for me, I would say that, you know, the first thing is we need women to be trained into, you know, how to engage all these spaces. Right. So for the WCC, they have what we call the Women's Human Rights Advocacy Training. And there, then we explain, you know, to the women, you know, where are the spaces where advocacy can be done? Because the CSW is not the only space for us to do advocacy on gender issues. Right. They train you how to do advocacy in your own country, uh, in the different UN spaces, because there are, there are many spaces within the UN where we can raise gender issues, right? So once you have the training, then you know how you know, to, to do advocacy at the CSW, at you know, other UN, organizations, you know, with your own country. Yeah, so for me, the first thing is your church must have that training, you know, made available to anyone who is interested in doing advocacy on gender issues. Then you begin to use the mechanisms that are open to us to use. And I would also say um, you have uh, opportunities in your communities, in your churches to hear about issues that affect women in other places, right? So you might know a lot about your own community. And I know here in the U.S., we tend to be very U.S. focused. Most of the COVID coverage that I've seen is about the U.S. Uh, rather than about how it's affecting people in other parts of the world. So, um, you know, there's a variety of different things that, that women care about in other parts of the world. So I, I like CSW as an educational opportunity. You get to hear these voices from women around the world and hear of issues that are affecting them and, and how they care about uh, and what they care about. So, um, you know, I would encourage you to seek out a variety of news sources. Global Ministries has a whole lot of, you know, uh, various resources about what our partners are talking about in concerning, concerning gender issues. Um, so I'd encourage you all to, to look at globalministries.org and our website there for some of those types of resources. Um, but also, yeah, so the, there's the education piece to it, which is, you know, learning how to be an advocate, um, which really a lot of it is just finding confidence to speak about issues that you care about. I know when I first started a lot of these things, I was like, well, why does my representative care what I have to say? And you make them care, right? You talk about it in ways uh, you know, you, when you get passionate about something, other people become passionate about it with you, right? So it's, it's, this is important to me and you need to, you know, raise your voice and, and get that, that confidence to talk about it in your communities, talk about it with your friends, talk about it with your family members, write a letter to the editor of your local newspaper talking about these, these issues in your community as well as uh, these various global issues. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, a, a lot of them, like we we're saying, um, they're happening in the US and they're also happening in other countries, right? We're not unique in, in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, so I would, I think I'll, I might leave it there. Yeah. Could I also just mention that he, uh, the WCC had the decade of the churches in solidarity with women, where they were raising the same issues that we have mentioned. And in 2018, we had a, a, you know, a time to come together and reflect on this. And basically, we were looking at, you know, how do we continue the agenda of the um, decade of the churches in solidarity with women, you know, so that we promote women's education, we promote no violence against women, we promote 
economic justice for women and then racial issues you know how do we deal with all these issues uh, from a gendered perspective but using our faith as the perspective that you know we are analyzing everything that is happening out there so when we are doing advocacy we need to do it as women of faith we shouldn't forget that so we need to know our theology quite well, the Bible very well. Uh, you don't just say the Bible says, right? But you need to understand the theological underpinning of whatever it is that you are saying. Thank you both so much for a rich, uh, very textured hour. Um, and um, I see um, that there are some, some questions that I think we've answered. Um, about empowering um, empowering women. And Peg Miller, I want you to know that that can happen at any age to continue being an advocate, writing letters, mentoring other women, mm -hmm. uh, that those are also ways of, of being involved. Yes, this webinar is being recorded um, and will be made available as will the transcript. We will also be providing um, the resources that we've discussed here. Um, there is a document um, that was um, that is the report of the Secretary General um, for UN Women. We will make that available, as will um, um, we'll also make available the outcome document that um, that Isabel mentioned. Um, we'll also put in there the connections to. Um, uh, Thursdays in Black, although we did not get to specific conversation about that, but that is a very specific program that is addressing gender-based violence in the church. And also, um, you know, we want to make sure that everything that we do, that we understand that we are not alone, but we're doing this together. The statistics that I talked about at the top of the hour are also on the UN Women's page. So we'll also make that link available as well. I want to thank you all for being here. Know that this is not an ending conversation. This is a beginning. We have lots more to talk about and a lot of work to do because I wanna say that every decade should be about the churches in solidarity with women and we will make it so together. So thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Becca, for being present with us today. Thank you. Siblings in Christ, if this conversation has moved you, if what's been offered here has helped enhance your ministry or your soul, please consider donating towards the annual fund of the United Church of Christ by texting UCC to 41444. Your support will help programs like this in the essential work of the United Church of Christ. Thank you for your support. Be blessed as you continue your day. Know that you are not alone, and we are holding you in prayer. Amen. <laughs>